Hi, I'm Steve Schindler. I'm Katie Wilson Milney. Welcome to the Art Law Podcast, a monthly podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The Art Law Podcast is sponsored by the law firm of Schindler Cohen and Hockman LLP, a premier litigation and art law boutique in New York City. Hi, Steve. And hi, Katie. So we are revisiting an old topic today, Steve, with a new guest. We're going to talk again about the Salvador Mundi, the famous painting uh, by Leonardo da Vinci that sold at Christie's in 2017 for almost half a billion dollars, which would make it the most expensive work of art that we know of sold of all time. And we had a really interesting discussion with Ben Lewis, who wrote a book called The Last Leonardo about the history of that painting and the history of that body of work by Leonardo in his studio. So we're having another discussion today with someone who featured prominently in that discussion, but wasn't there to speak for himself, Robert Simon, the New York City art dealer who found this obscure auction catalog from a tiny auction house in New Orleans. And he bought it for about a thousand dollars with a partner. So he didn't even spend a thousand dollars on it. And um, that little piece of wood that he bought is the painting that sold at Christie's for half a million dollars. Now, sadly, Robert was not the seller at Christie's. So he did not net all the proceeds from that particular sale, but he, he's, the one discovered and largely worked on the restoration and research around that painting that led to its acceptance, at least by many, as a genuine Leonardo and not by, you know, a student of or a copy. I think one of the things that is interesting to me, at least, is this question of authenticity and how does one conclude, particularly at the kinds of price points that we're talking about, that a work that's not signed by Leonardo da Vinci, for which there's precious little writing, certainly no contemporaneous writing. How did it come to pass that this obscure work that ended up in a New Orleans home was deemed all of a sudden to be a work by the great master Leonardo da Vinci? And that's the story that both Ben and Robert try to tell in slightly different ways. And we definitely suggest for our listeners going back and listening to our podcast with Ben Lewis about the history of this painting and also the background on Leonardo's work when he might have been painting these types of paintings, the different multiple paintings that exist like this. It's a fascinating story and we do lay it out there in some detail. I guess as a, you know, a very brief reminder, the idea of those who think that this painting sold at Christie's in 2017 is an original work by Leonardo, is that Leonardo was living in France at the end of his life in the 1500s and painted it for the royal family. Somehow, through probably through marriage, the painting gets to England into the collection of Charles I and somehow stays in England in a variety of royal households for hundreds and hundreds of years until it's sold in 1900 to a dealer or advisor of the Cook Collection, which is a very, very famous art collection in the UK. And it stays in that family, the Cook family, not recognized as Leonardo, kept in the basement you know, of a building in London during World War II, not even deemed important enough to evacuate. And then it's sold for you know, 45 pounds in the 1950s to a couple from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, who's there on vacation. At an auction where there were present some pretty famous and sophisticated collectors, because this was, after all, an auction of works from the Cook Collection, which, as you mentioned, was a very well-known and prestigious collection. And yet this couple from New Orleans were the only ones who saw fit to purchase it for a small sum of money. And they bring it back on their cruise ship, I guess, back to Louisiana, and they pass away and it passes to their heirs in succession. And then one of their heirs sells it in 2005 through this auction house for about a thousand dollars. And I think is pretty upset now discovering that it was well, in I, fact I think Leonardo. The other thing that we learned is that Christie's was also called down to take a look at the works in the estate of this New Orleans family. And the idea was that Christie's would bring back to New York to sell 
the better works and in fact left behind the so-called Leonardo to be sold at a small auction house in New Orleans. So Christie's passed on this work too, effectively, the first time around. So one of the interesting things also is listening to Robert go through the sort of the epiphany or the moment when he began to believe that this was a work by Leonardo. Yeah, and and he, you know, I think we can tell from talking to him and also just from understanding what the records are like in talking to Ben that this is not a case where you can really dig through the history and get a definitive answer, right? There are no pictures from the 1600s from Charles the first collection, right? There's no exhibition catalog that makes it absolutely clear which version of what is where. We have records of a painting with this name, not necessarily by Leonardo. And we know that there are many paintings with this name in the world, and most of them are not by Leonardo. So, you know, we, we have this sort of jumble of historical evidence that's not conclusive until we get to 1900, where we know that this very painting, the one that sold to Christie's, you know, gets into the Cook collection, gets sold to this family in Louisiana, that gets to Robert Simon, you know, gets to auction at Christie's again for half a billion dollars. And so this, this realization that Robert has with some of his colleagues that the work is a Leonardo in their minds, or, you know, maybe a Leonardo is, is an impression, right? They don't have better historical evidence than anyone else. There's, they're not finding some perfect document. They are just looking at it. And we, as lay people, we just trust them because we can't make the determination if Leonardo painted anything or how much needs to be repainted. So this is a very interesting example of that. And hopefully our listeners will find it interesting. I'm sure they will. We're here today with Robert Simon, the co-author, along with Martin Kemp and Margaret Dalival, of a recently published book entitled Leonardo's Salvador Mundi and the Collecting of Leonardo in the Stewart Courts. Robert Simon is the president of Robert Simon Fine Art, a New York City gallery focused on European painting. He received his doctorate from Columbia University and his academic specialty is Florentine painting of the 16th century. He has published and lectured on both art historical matters and on broader concerns relating to the authenticity valuation, conservation, and commercial trade of works of art. He has held leadership roles in the Appraisers Association of America, the Art and Antique Dealers League of America, and the Private Art Dealers Association. And of course, Mr. Simon, along with Alex Parrish and Warren Adelson, has now achieved new art world celebrity as discoverer and purchaser for a modest sum of the Salvador Mundi from an obscure New Orleans auction house in 2005. 12 years after he purchased it on November 15, 2017, at Christie's New York post-war and contemporary evening sale, the hammer came down on lot 9B, a small painting entitled Salvador Mundi by Leonardo da Vinci. At just over $450 million, it was and still is today the most expensive painting ever sold. The story has been the subject of books, articles, and now we have just learned a new Broadway musical. So we are fortunate today to have Robert Simon as our guest to talk about that fantastic journey. Robert Simon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. So, it's great to be a part of it. And um, just as you summarize it, it's kind of an, an amazing journey from scholarly obscurity to Broadway. <laughs> We can yeah. talk about who is going to play you in the musical, but let's start with the book, though. A scholarly book published by Oxford University Press. Tell us why you decided to write the book. Well, I think th there is so much that's been said, and so much speculation about the discovery of the painting, the course of the research, the conservation of it. And it was important to have the material and the story of the discovery of the picture and its kind of transformation from being an obscure anonymous painting into one that's established as a work by Leonardo, it's important to present this in a serious context because so much has appeared 
in popular media, in popular books, you know, on the internet, so much that's actually inaccurate or exaggerated or opinionated. And just to have a starting point for the future discussion of the painting. Robert, who are your co-authors? Can you tell us? Well, Martin Kemp is certainly well established as uh, probably the le leading Leonardo scholar in the world. He's, his career is one of a series of the distinguished publications, exhibitions, articles, and the like, devoted to the study of uh, really all aspects of Leonardo's work, both the artistic, scientific, and probably most impressive at all, uh, an analysis really of his the way that his mind worked and how all these different aspects of his uh, genius were connected. So th he's one co-author. And then Margaret Dalival, who is a, a scholar specializing in provenance and the history of collecting in England in the time of Charles I and subsequently, she's a brilliant scholar who delved into the manuscripts and also broadened the research from just this one painting to the collecting of uh, works by Leonardo and paintings that were thought to be by Leonardo in that period in the uh, 17th century. And Robert, you are, you know, sort of the prime character in the beginning of the saga and have firsthand knowledge of all of the issues that have been debated and raised in the press and in other writings. You know, we discussed some of these issues with Ben Lewis, who is the author of a book called The Last Leonardo, and we did a podcast with him. And his book, well, I think is very thorough. He has raised some skepticism about the process of discovery and restoration and the history of this painting. And so we, you know, very much want to touch on your views on all of those things to get your perspective. Sure. And I know you're familiar sure. with Ben's take on this. No, I, I am, although I have to say it's been a while since I read it. And basically, we have very different points of view, just in terms of the nature of the books. I mean, Ben's book is meant to be a successful book. <laughs> meant to sell copies. And so if there is any kind of uh, skepticism, it makes the story more interesting. Right. Well, let's actually start with your first contact with this work, because I found that a really intriguing part of the story. How did you first learn about the work? And tell us just a little bit about what took you from New York to the attention of the sale of this work at a New Orleans auction house. Well, I think part of what I do professionally, certainly before this, and still actually do it now, is look for old master paintings that have lost their identity, that have been relegated into the pile of decorative or undecorative works of art. Since most old masters are not signed and one has to rely on questions of style and quality, really, to determine authorship. And this is something that I share professionally and personally with Alex Parrish, who's been a colleague of mine. I mean, we're not officially business partners. We're just very good friends who've bought paintings together over the years. And so the painting began with the two of us independently noting this picture in this auction in New Orleans. It was obscure as it was. They produced printed catalogs, and I subscribed to those catalogs. And one day, the catalog appeared in my mailbox, and it was a painting that I noted. And very soon after, maybe the next day or two, Alex called me. He had seen it same painting online and said, well, what do you think of it? And that conversation is really what began this whole saga. What did you think <laughs> of it, Robert? I mean, what, what did you see yeah. when you saw the catalog entry? Well, in this case, you know, drawing on my academic training and my previous work on Leonardo, although I've not published anything extensively or one article really, but Leonardo for me and for many people, many sort of in the scholarly field, but just many people on the planet consider Leonardo to be a, a hero. And so at the age of 14, I was at Leonardo's supposed birth house in Vinci. I've been, I think I had seen every painting by him that's known or acknowledged over the course of my travels. So when I saw this picture, I recognized it as being a version of a lost painting by him, uh, one that was debated whether even it had been painted, whether it may have been, in fact, just a drawing that had been elaborated by students. So there were a few paintings of the composition that were known, but none that had really achieved any acceptance as a work by Leonardo. And so it was intriguing because anything to having to do with Leonardo was of interest 
personally, but also the hope, really, the prospect was that maybe this was by one of Leonardo's students. And it would be not only of interest at a scholarly level, but also on a commercial level. It worked by Leonardo's followers, Boltrofio, Bellini, Gian Pietrino. These are works that are considerable interest in the marketplace. When you're scrolling through these yeah. catalogs, is it in your mind that you're looking for a Leonardo or something in the <laughs> workshop of Leonardo? I mean, how much are you on a search for this rather than, you know, you're perusing and you're just seeing whatever's out there? I'm just perusing. I mean, this is the only painting I've ever had experience with in my, you know, career as a as an art dealer that had anything really close to being with Leonardo. Maybe we could back up a little for our listeners and remind them sort of what the history of this painting was that brought it to New Orleans and how one thing amazing thing about this story is why nobody else who looked at this painting, we know kind of surfaces in 1908, right? It ends up in this famous British collection and then is sort of not regarded as anything special in that time until the last couple of years. So how does it end up in New Orleans and why are you the first person to give it this kind of attention and figure out that it is actually a painting of note? Well, I mean, one aspect, of course, is that in the previous 50 years from the time we acquired it, the painting had been in a series of private homes in New Orleans and in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Basically, it had never been uh, in that time exhibited in any museum or public venue that we know of. So it was acquired in 1900 by Frederick Cook and the Cook Collection, that is to say the collection formed by him, his son and grandson, was one of the most notable and publicly visitable collections in England. It was based in Richmond, a suburb of London. We know that the painting was there from first years of the 20th century until the Second World War. Many art historians visited it. Herbert Cook, who is Frederick Cook's son, was an art historian. He was even a specialist in, in the work of Leonardo. And he, as well as everyone else who passed through the collection, pretty much overlooked this painting and the reason for it, I think, is clear, and that is that it was damaged and crudely repainted at some point, probably at many points in its history. But certainly by the time it arrived in the Cook Collection, and this is evidenced by the 1908 photograph you just referred to, the face had been really rather crudely overpainted. And so it was not a really an attractive picture, to say the least. Having said that, aspects of the painting had been pretty much unscathed, the hand, the blessing hand of Christ, particularly, which is really quite remarkable in its quality and its preservation. It really has a lot to do with the fact that it's human nature when you see, whether it's a person or a painting, to focus on the faults. And I think that's the reason why the painting was overlooked with the Second World War, most of the important paintings, things that were deemed important, were evacuated from, from London, sent to Wales. But this painting was put in the basement of the house in Richmond, which sustained bombing during the war. And it's only a miracle that it survived. But after the conclusion of the war, it was relegated to warehouses, passed over by dealers that would come to pick pictures from the collection to uh, acquire, passed over by the curators of the collection who brought in conservators and it was thought not worthy of restoration. And finally, in 1958, the residue of the collection was sold at public auction by Sotheby's in London, where this picture, still with an attribution as a copy of a painting by Boltrafio, one of Leonardo's students, was sold for £45. At the time that I acquired the painting, I was able to establish the provenance of the Cook collection because of inscriptions on the back of the painting, a number that was stenciled on the front of the painting, and then ultimately from discovering this early photograph from 1908 and comparing them with the picture. However, how it had gotten from London to New Orleans was a bit of a mystery, but that was something later we were able to establish. All credit to Ben Lewis, he was critical in finding kind of the missing link in that vacationing, antique collecting couple from New Orleans was in London at the time and bought the picture at the sale. After they passed, the painting was inherited by relatives who were in Baton Rouge, and at their death, the painting was put in the state sale for auction. I had been able to determine 
who had consigned the picture to the auction in New Orleans, but that connection between Cook and New Orleans was not one that I was able to establish, but now we have that particular connection. So since we're talking about provenance, you know, I think it's fairly compelling and there seems to be some consensus that this is the painting that was in the Cook collection. We can trace it back to around 1900, but what happened before that? I mean, I think that's where the story gets a little harder to understand because first of all, I mean, one thing to remind our listeners is that there are multiple Salvador Mundi paintings, right? So we're now we're entering this period where it's more difficult to figure out what is this exact painting versus another painting referred to. And the further back in time we go, we don't have photographic catalogs. We don't have as much contemporaneous evidence. What contemporaneous evidence we do have is notebooks that sort of reference the painting by name, but then there are lots of paintings with the name Salvador Mundi. So what happens before 1900? No, it's true. There's no direct connection between Leonardo and this painting. And having said that, there's pretty much no direct connection between Leonardo and pretty much any of his paintings that we recognize as being by him today. The only picture with a continuous provenance from the artist to 2020 is The Last Supper in Milan, because it's been on the same wall since the time it was painted. So there are gaps with all paintings, and that includes Mona Lisa and every painting that is really acknowledged as being by Leonardo. Some of them have provenances that go back uh, a couple of hundred years, but this is a very contentious field and one that we really are dealing with the likelihood of where a painting was at any particular time. And in this, we rely on descriptions and manuscripts, literary references. Occasionally, we have copies of the paintings and the evidence of writers on the artist. So it's not really uh, the demand in a way that people seem to have that this painting you know, should be connected seamlessly with the master is really unrealistic. So we're dealing with descriptions. Uh, sometimes they can be conflicting and almost always are inexact. The requirements that we'd like to have as art historians or be a description of the painting, name of the artist and the dimensions, and maybe a connection to a collection before or after, but that's rarely present. And you're quite right. In the 19th century, just going through auction catalogs, there are dozens of paintings that are called Leonardo, called Salvator Mundi, or Head of Christ, or Blessing Christ, so many descriptions that are possible. And we really don't have any evidence of the location of this painting before the late 1890s until, in all likelihood, it's time in the collection of Charles I. But we have no concrete proof. There's no smoking gun. And uh, why, so why, Robert, do we think that this particular Salvador Mundi was the one in Charles the First collection. And maybe you can describe, you know, why that collection is so important. But, you know, I know this has also been a point of controversy. And I believe Ben brought up on our podcast that, you know, there's another Salvador Mundi that's made its way. It's now in Russia that does bear the marking or sort of the branding that Charles the First put on his works in his collection. And this Salvador Mundi does not have that marking. And so What's the basis well, the re- the re- this sure. the work? First, uh, as for the reason why this Salvatore Mundi doesn't have the brand on the back, is that the back of the painting is not, you know, has been shaved down. It's been thinned and then glued to another panel and then what's called cradling, which is a support system. So the back of the panel, when, when acquired and then even after conservation, is a much thinner work than the panel was when it was painted. There is no brand on the back of the panel, but then again, there's no marking of any kind. There's really, that's one of the things that's been lost and really one of the reasons why the painting had been overpainted because the panel had clearly cracked and these repairs were done in order to stabilize the picture, essentially to save it. So that's quite true. And the fact that there were two paintings, actually there were three paintings in Charles I's collection that were considered to be by Leonardo. One is the St. John the Baptist, which is now in the Louvre. And then there were two paintings that were in the very precise inventory done after the execution of Charles I. This is the Charles I collection, probably the greatest art collection ever assembled of paintings and of antique sculpture. After his execution, the paintings were all inventoried and they were distributed to what were called dividends, which were the groups of creditors who were owed money by the crown. 
And there are there were two there, and I think it's impossible really to say which was which, except one of these wound up in Moscow and one of them wound up in New Orleans. What's incredible about this, too, is that even though there's this long history and we think we could discover so many facts and documents, what it's really coming down to today is the modern eye of experts, right? You, Martin Kemp, you know, other scholars of Leonardo are looking at this painting and making a judgment call about whether it's by him or by his workshop or by a disciple of his or, you know, a later copy. And that actually is so much of what we're relying on is just a contemporary eye rather than having any kind of real historical hard evidence. I mean, and you talk about that and it's so striking given the value of this painting and the importance we placed on it that it really just comes down to someone looking at it today and giving their opinion. Yes, it's true. And it's true, of course, with we focus on Leonardo, and especially in this conversation, but it has to do with our understanding of art of the past generally. Leonardo never signed any of his paintings. This is something to point out. And that signatures on works of the period of Leonardo were pretty rare. It really wasn't until the late 18th and the 19th century that artists would sign paintings with any kind of regularity. So the art historian, the critic, just the general viewer has to rely on a number of factors to determine origin and possible authorship of a work of art going back to antiquity. I mean, when you look at ancient works of art, uh, very, very rarely, I mean, it's absolutely exceptional when the work can be given to a particular artist, and it's almost on literary descriptions that that happens. So one relies on what generally called the eye, which is probably a little too general a a statement, but basically the the tools of what's called connoisseurship, which is recognition of visual qualities combined with the technical issues in terms of how something was made, the materials that are used, and again, documentary records that we have, historical records, all kind of put together. So it may seem to be completely vague when somebody says, I think this is by one artist or another. But it's actually rather rational, even at times quite scientific. And I liken it a little bit to the process that happens when your best friend calls you on the telephone. That person doesn't have to identify his or herself. You know the voice because you recognize it because all these factors that you can't really define are there. Let's see if we can fast Let's forward again <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to 2005 and your purchase of this work at the New Orleans auction. And I don't want you to sell yourself short here because we know that at the Sotheby's auction in 1958, there were some very distinguished historians and collectors at that auction and they passed on this work and the gentleman from New Orleans, Warren Kunst, bought it for 45 pounds. And then again in 2005, prior to the New Orleans auction, the descendant of Mr. Kuntz hired Christie's and had Christie's come down and they took the top works back to sell in New York and left the rest. And one of the works that was left was the Salvatore Mundi. So by the time you and Alex Parrish came along, some very significant art world people had looked at this work and not really noticed it. So now you purchase it, and can we ask how much you paid for it? Seems to be some controversy about that. I can you remember, eleven hundred fifty dollars. Right, but best um, I mean, that's one of the, <laughs> you ever made, Robert. It was it was a good investment. So you bring it back to New York, and then uh, at some point you take it to Diana Modestini's for her to look at, and maybe just describe a little bit about the condition that it was in when you had it, and and what led you to Ms. Modestini's doorstep? Well, first I should mention a word about Diane Modestini and her husband, Mario Modestini, who have been friends, acquaintances for, for many, many years. When I first met Diane in the, around 1980, I think it was, when I was a, a research fellow at the Metropolitan Museum, and she was working in the painting conservation department. She was a conservator there. Over the years, I had come to know her husband, Mario, separately. He's probably the most distinguished painting conservator for Renaissance paintings of his time, and one who was 
pretty much responsible for the counsel to Samuel Cress and the creation of the Cress Collection, the greatest assemblage of Italian paintings in America, most of them in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, and the rest in regional museums across the country. So Romario is instrumental in that, but in his retirement, essentially, from that position, he was a distinguished private conservator and a very wise and generous man. And so he was someone who was in many ways a mentor to me. I would occasionally go to his studio and he would show me what he was working on and also explain things. And he was really a great teacher in that regard. In 2005, Mario is 98 years old. And so he was pretty much housebound. And at the time I had acquired, I hadn't seen him in, in some time. And a mutual friend said that they were going over for drinks and that I'd like to come visit. And I did and had a very nice conversation with him. And I mentioned then that I had recently purchased a very interesting picture. And I thought that it might be something that Mario would like to see. And I'd also like his opinion and Diane's opinion about its condition, since it was clearly problematic. And one of the reasons that why Mario is a terrific person to ask is that he was the person charged by Paul Bellin to vet essentially the Ginevra da Benci painting by Leonardo, which was acquired in the 1960s by the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And he has worked on many pictures by Leonardo and his students. So I thought his opinion would be invaluable, as with Diane's. Diane has been for some time in private practice, but in Recent years, she's been a professor at New York University teaching painting conservation. So what was essentially a social call, and that's what started the whole process of its uh, conservation. And Diane, you know, gets quite invested in the painting. You talk about that, and you know, she's talked about that, and Ben writes about that in his book as well. And she takes a really lead role in resuscitating this painting and sort of bringing it back to life. And Steve and I have talked on this podcast a few times about you know, the interesting issues about restoration versus authenticity and what is the balance with repainting or reconstituting a work of art by a modern hand and how that's done. And we've commented that you know, when you go to the Met or the National Gallery, your average person walking around does not understand that the paintings they're looking at have largely been repainted. And so just sort of understanding how that practice happens, especially with the work this old, you know, from the 1500s. And how did Diane approach that? You know, how did you and Diane approach that process of restoration of this work, given how heavily overpainted it was, you know, how much needed to be done? Sure. I think one thing that is confusing to many people and a word that you use indistinguishably with in painting, and that is repainting. The idea of repainting is taking something that's been painted and then painting over it. And that's not what was involved in this process at all. And that's something that had been done to the painting over the years, over hundreds of years, which is why it looked so really awful upon its acquisition. Several people, some skilled, I should say some less skilled than others, who had made an attempt to reconstruct passages that were missing. And then the easiest way really to make that integrated with the surviving painting is to cover up areas. So that's why that painting had been so extensively repainted. But conservators today adhere to really quite rigid ethical standards about leaving the original to the extent absolutely uh, one can, and only limiting restoration to lost areas, and those areas to be done in a completely reversible manner, and also to document this fully. I mean, what are the interesting aspects of this whole so-called controversy about the painting is that the conservation treatment has been extensively criticized and talked about by many people who really don't know much about conservation treatment, but even those that have some familiarity with it. Well, this project has been so properly and fully documented at every stage. And for those that are interested in this, Diane has a, a website called salvatormundirevisited.com in which one can see high-resolution photographs and analyses and the discussion of the treatment of the painting. But having said that, one of the things that goes on in a museum like the Met or the National Gallery is a collaboration between the art historians who are the curators and also outside scholars 
and the painting conservation people who, when they work together, there's tremendous advances that are made in the understanding of paintings and to resolve exactly how best to restore a painting and to make it presentable. In this case, having the ability to work with Diane to discuss things gave me, gave the painting, I should say, kind of its best chance to be presented properly. In terms of what you were suggesting, there are different philosophies about what kind of restoration should be done. When you look at an ancient sculpture, if there's an arm missing, that arm stays missing. I mean, we're used to seeing works of antiquity as fragments. In some circles in Europe and Italy, particularly, some restorers like to leave gaps that are in the painting unrestored so that one just sees the residue of the original paint. But in kind of Western museum world, with most of Europe, certainly in England and the United States, the goal is as much as possible to make the work live and be effective as a work of art. So if there is a gap, if there is a lacuna, if there is a crack, if there is a loss of paint, to in-paint it, and that is to say to restore it as much as possible and to bridge that gap to the surviving paint surface. And that's what was done here. It's no different than what's done in museums and done ethically and quite appropriately. Right. We certainly weren't suggesting that anything that you did was unethical. I think it's just interesting that Diane made some, you know, fairly significant decisions, and I gather made them with you about, for example, there were two thumbs, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. She decided to mask the first in favor of the second. And these are decisions that you and she made together. No, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, the two thumbs, on the one hand, really gave the most obvious indication that this was the original painting because it showed the artist at work and changing his mind. And we discussed this extensively, even on the commercial level, it made the painting more obvious to anyone looking at it that it was the original. On the other hand, it turned the painting in the figure of Christ into somewhat of a freak because people have one thumb. (laughs) And so it seems a kind of a self-indulgent thing to show. And so we discussed this at extensively, but also discussed it with outside people. I mean, one of the people we spoke with about this particular issue was Luke Sison, who was the curator at the National Gallery in London, who was responsible ultimately for the Leonardo exhibition. He's now the director of the Fitzwilliam Museum in England. And so we wanted his opinion as well. This was a kind of collaborative decision. And if the current owners would like to reveal the second thumb at some point, since restoration of the sort is by its nature reversible, that can happen. And I think you describe in your book the moment that you and Diane were viewing the painting in her studio, and I think both had the revelation that this was a work by Leonardo. Could you talk a little bit about that? When did you? begin to believe that what you were looking at was not a work by a follower or a studio work, but an autograph work of Leonardo da Vinci? Well, I should perhaps preface this by saying I'm, I'm not a dreamer or a fabulist. And so whereas many people who are sort of out on the hunt for paintings for, or for a copy of the Declaration of Independence in a flea market or whatever it might be, immediately go to the greatest possibility and start believing that. I'm by nature, a doubter and quite critical. So as each stage in this process developed, I resisted, resisted calling it Leonardo, considering it was by a Leonardo. And I think that was a healthy thing to do. But there was this one point, which I mentioned in the book, when it was very clear that this pentimento, which is this change in the thumb, which was kind of evident really from the very beginning of the cleaning process. At one point, I came to Diane's studio, we sat we looked at it and then looked at the evidence of the pentimenti, not just the one in the thumb, which was visible, but also others that we were able to discern through imaging, infrared reflectography particularly, and started to think of what explanations there could be for these changes and for the way the painting looked and also for its relationship to the many copies that I had been able to document in the time I was doing research on the painting. And it came as this wonderful, rather frightening moment that this had to be the lost original. And yes, there was a kind of eureka moment, although it kind of crept 
up very slowly. I mean, this is two years after the purchase of the painting. In a way, it was convincing myself of something that I had resisted for so long. So there was this kind of moment of both release and relief, and also a bit of awe that somehow this is something that I was dealing with myself. And, you know, then that's sort of the beginning that leads you, I think, to the high point where the National Gallery in London, you know, gets involved and buys into this attribution or reattribution of this work as by Leonardo himself and inclusion of it in the exhibition that they had there in 2011. So can you talk about that? And also the timeline is interesting because you and your partners still own the painting, your dealers. So presumably it's still going to be sold. But in the interim, it's sort of adopted by the National Gallery in London and goes up on display there. And then, you know, after it comes down, you sort of start the process of trying to sell it. And we want to sort of go through that timeline and the role of the National Gallery in creating marketability for this work, which of course, as we discussed, no one before knew existed. At this point, the hurdle has been, uh, you know, I've gone over the hurdle that I've convinced myself that it's by Leonardo and really what to do with it, how to present it to the world, because it's so, in art historical circles, it's so unbelievable in a way. And I tried to think of who, as a, an art historian, I thought was kind of the finest connoisseur of Italian painting and probably most independent and less inclined to have any kind of preconceptions one person that occurred to me was Nicholas Penny. He's now Sir Nicholas Penny, but at the time, he was the curator of sculpture at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And I had met him on a couple of occasions that I'd certainly read many of his publications and attended lectures by him. And he always impressed me as a fair, sober, and a super intelligent scholar and as a great connoisseur of Italian painting. So I wrote to him. I said, um, I have a very interesting Italian painting I'd like to show. I think it's quite important. But I I didn't mention the name Leonardo because I thought that might scare him. And he said he'd be in New York in a a few weeks. And indeed, he did come and it was December of uh, 2017. And uh, I took the painting from the studio, brought it to my little gallery at the time. And he came in and basically after a bit of study and pretty much no conversation between the two of us. He said that I had a very interesting problem, but he certainly recognized it as being by Leonardo. And I asked him, how did he think this should be presented to other scholars and to the world? And what is the best way to proceed? He told me that he'd call me the next day. And indeed he did. He called me and said, I think, first of all, you should share the news of this with Metropolitan Museum. They're your local museum and with great scholars and people involved. He, at this time, had been appointed the director of the National Gallery in London, and a good way to present it would be to take it to National Gallery's Virgin of the Rocks off exhibition for a day, compare the two pictures, and invite principal Leonardo scholars to see it on this kind of neutral ground and for them to study the painting independently. And indeed, that's what happened. The painting in January of 2018 was taken to the Metropolitan Museum for safekeeping and also to allow their conservation department to use their advanced equipment in terms of infrared reflectography and like, and to study the picture. And it stayed there until May 2018, at which point I took the picture to London. And the picture was placed with the Virgin of the Rocks, and this group of scholars were invited to look at the painting independently and together. And that's really how the scholarly consensus uh, appeared. Could you just talk a little bit about the process of that consensus? I am intrigued also that Sir Penny was able to make up his mind, you know, in such a short period of time as a non-art historian. It would seem to me that that's a sort of monumental decision that somehow it might take more study. And I, I don't know whether that was a surprising conclusion that he reached so quickly, but you can talk about that, but also... We are interested in this sort of process of the invitation of scholars to the National Gallery. There has been some criticism, I guess, of the sort of informality of it and the way that that was done. This would be a chance for you to address that. Sure. Certainly understanding things, as I just referred to, you know, recognizing your friend's voice on the phone, recognizing an artist's hand in a painting can be, with a great courtesy, pretty much an immediate, a pursue, an immediate understanding 
And I think that's what occurred with Nicholas Penny. However, that immediate reaction gets backed up by consideration of all sorts of ancillary issues having to do with the scholarship and the condition and and provenance issues. So there may be an immediate response, but it is considered and reflected upon. Now, the, the whole idea of this was for it to be an informal presentation of the painting to scholars where they would not have to commit themselves, where they could indeed look at the picture, give their personal opinions, and then at the time I was there, I was able to give them all the copies of all the conservation reports, treatments, photographs, infrareds, in treatment material for them then to study and to consider. So this was not an event where people were either put on the spot or in any way asked to form their opinions immediately. As I mentioned, I was present at this meeting, both as the caretaker of the painting, but also to provide any information to questions that might arise, which many did. And the opinions of the scholars was then conveyed to the curator, Luke Sison, some weeks afterwards. So the idea that that was somehow improper or irregular is completely misplaced, as was the idea which not all the scholars agreed on the attribution, which is, I can say, false, because when the time came for the painting to be announced before the exhibition opened, I wrote to each one of them and asked whether they would commit to using their name in supporting the attribution, and each one of them said yes. So this, is again, is a kind of uh, trying to make controversy out of a situation where there really wasn't any. Because this is another criticism or just observation that I think sounds critical to me that's been raised. Is, Is it unusual for a painting that is for sale to be displayed in a museum exhibition like this? How does that impact your role as a dealer and the sale of the painting after? Now, I think you would assume that it would dramatically assist the sale of the painting, raise its profile, right? It's every collector's and dealer's dream to have something they're going to sell be highlighted in a top museum like this. But somewhat ironically, I think you had some difficulty selling it. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that and the interaction of the museum show on the subsequent sale and your sale efforts. Sure. Well, I think one of the things, uh, again, that's sort of out there in the kind of popular discussion of this is that the painting was for sale at the time. And I can assure you that the painting was not for sale. It wasn't for sale leading up to the exhibition. And it really wasn't even for sale after the exhibition. We never actually marketed the picture. There were some inquiries from museums during this time, but for a painting to be exhibited at so distinguished a museum as the National Gallery, which besides being phenomenally prominent, is a government institution, there was the tacit understanding that the picture would not be marketed, would not be for sale. And the approaches in the, after the exhibition, as you should say, Again, the painting, as is fairly well known, was being sought after for acquisition by the Dallas Museum of Art. And that was not something that was even instigated by the owners. It was something that the then director wished to pursue. And it's actually its eventual sale through private sale afterwards was also something that was not instigated by us. It was something that came to us. Yes, the painting obviously was sold, but we were kind of passive participants in this whole process. I particularly was one, I mean, handling the scholarly aspect and dealing with museums and like, I wanted nothing to do with the sale process and stayed very much away from it, even in its ultimate sale. But the entire desire for myself and my colleagues who own the picture was for the painting to go to a public collection. So the painting was known to certain museums, certain curators, and certainly during the exhibition, it was known and talked about. And as presented to us by the eventual purchaser, it was to go on public exhibition. Turned out not to be the case, but that was one of the reasons we accepted the offer that was made for it. Were you surprised, Robert, that it didn't get sold to an institution and that museums passed up the opportunity to purchase this work? And maybe that it took so long to sell. You know, I understand you weren't actively marketing it in the way you might other paintings, but sort of what are your yes. thoughts on yes. how you ultimately sold it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I was surprised. I mean, I understood that public institutions do not have the funds, really, to make major acquisitions of this sort. For example, being a New Yorker, I would uh, love the painting to have gone to the Metropolitan Museum. I know their acquisitions came under a fair amount of criticism when they acquired the Duccio Madonna for $40-plus million. 
but there are a lot of uh, very impressive donors in New York, and I would love the picture to have stayed here. And the owners of the picture, all being Americans, would have been quite open to a substantial donation of interest in the picture for it to stay in in the United States. But the one real effort that was being made from Dallas Museum did not lead to a satisfactory conclusion after maybe nine months of their attempt to acquire the painting and fundraise for the picture. So yeah, it was very disappointing and not something that one could have anticipated. How did the sale to Yves Bouvier come about then? That happened in 2013, and then he immediately turned around and sold it to Dmitry Rivolovlev for $127.5 million. And of course, they have been locked in bitter controversy for a number of years over Mr. Rivolovlev's accusation that Yves Bouvier was acting as his agent and was essentially marking up and taking secret profits from the works that he was selling. So you ended up kind of selling into this soon to be very large dispute. How did that all happen and how did it make you feel? What you've just discussed and the identities of these people, of course, came to my knowledge only maybe two years later. So uh, basically, uh, my knowledge of it and the knowledge of our partners is that we were approached by Sotheby's and said that they had a private individual collector who was interested in the painting and who planned to put it on public view in Paris. And uh, Sotheby's acted as our representatives. We had no knowledge of the immediate or ultimate purchaser of the painting. And it was only with the revelation two years later of the issues between Bouvier and Rybolovyev, you know, the news goes on, it seems, daily with their legal dispute. You know, actually, in the time after the purchase, even leading up to 2015, when the painting was being requested for a large Leonardo exhibition that took place in Milan, the curator of the exhibition was Pietro Morani, who was one of the people from that 2008 meeting in the National Gallery, requesting the painting. And I would then pass on the request to Sotheby's, asking them to pass it on to the purchaser, and basically was told that they weren't interested in exhibiting it. Are you disappointed? in how I want to ask about the price because obviously we know that the painting sold three years ago for almost a half a billion dollars and that is not what you were paid. We I don't know what you were paid but we know that it wasn't that. So I don't know if you can sort of comment on the trajectory of that pricing in just a few short years and if you feel like the sale sort of through you and onward was problematic in any way because of that. And also, you know, how do you feel about where the painting is now? Which, by the way, we don't know where it is. So, <laughs> but how do you feel about that sort of <laughs> the disappearance of the painting into sort of oligarch private, you know, storage space land? Is that, I'm assuming from what you've told us today, that's not what you were hoping or anticipating. No, in that regard, yes, of course, the whole process was kind of shocking. And it's really quite amazing that changes in in the price, first in the price we were paid, and then evidently the price that the painting acquired 24 hours after we had sold it, when it was acquired by Mr. Rybolovyev, and then at the sale itself. But the basic situation in terms of our sale of it is that it was something that we accepted at the time, and we have to live with that. And, um, and that's fine. I mean, the sale, I was at the sale at Christie's when it sold for $450 million. And if anything, I just felt that the uh, opinion of the painting already had been so much discussed and it had justified so much of my opinion, the opinions of other scholars and the like. It's quote disappearance. I mean, it had disappeared after we had sold it in 2013 and without really any understanding of who had owned it. And we have a really good indication that it's now owned by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And my understanding is that they are building a museum trying to have a tourist industry and that eventually at some point it will go on exhibit there. It's a lot less convenient for me than the Metropolitan Museum where I wanted it to be. So it's a little disappointed in that regard. But I like to think that somehow a picture of this universal appeal may have great benefit being exhibited when it eventually does go on exhibition. So the painting itself, yes, it's disappointing that people cannot see it now, have not been able to see it. 
It seems as if it was almost agreed to to be exhibited at the Louvre, the Leonardo exhibition last fall. That didn't come to be for reasons that I gather are largely political. But, you know, a painting of this sort will not disappear ultimately and at some point will be viewable again and enjoyable by many, I certainly hope. And then we'll have the musical. Yeah, right. That's a good hope to end on. And we always have the musical, right? (laughs) We have the we have we have the musical. No, I mean I had heard about this through connections with the producer, and of course, there are a lot of things with the painting that, as it's become a kind of popular icon, things some things that I find amusing, some things I find offensive. But as time goes on, I just finding it a little more amusing more than anything else. It seems that the painting has such a phenomenal effect with people generally speaking that uh, and it also seems that everyone wants to have a piece of it one way or the other whether it's selling trinkets with the image on it or making a musical or writing a popular book or really just you know the number of memes that painting is really quite extraordinary it sort of rivals that of Mona Lisa at, at this point but I mean the painting is the painting it's a I find it a moving and powerful spiritual work of art And I think for those who have the sensitivity to appreciate it, it will remain so and become a uh, great part of our global cultural heritage. And for those that don't see it quite that way, they can maybe they can enjoy the musical as a substitute. And even before the musical comes out, you can still get the book, Leonardo's Salvador Mundi, and the collecting of Leonardo in the Stuart Courts, published by Oxford University Press. It's a great read. Thank you for coming, Robert. It was great. Thanks so much. And that's it for today's podcast. Please subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts and send us feedback at podcast at schlaw.com. And if you like what you hear, give us a five-star rating. We are also featuring the original music of Chris Thompson. And finally, we want to thank our fabulous producer, Jackie Santos, for making us sound so good. Until next time, I'm Katie Wilson-Milney. And I'm Steve Schindler, bringing you the Art Law Podcast, a podcast exploring the places where art intersects with and interferes with the law. The information provided in this podcast is not intended to be a source of legal advice. You should not consider the information provided to be an invitation for an attorney-client relationship, should not rely on the information as legal advice for any purpose, and should always seek the legal advice of competent counsel in the relevant jurisdiction.